The contents of my talk today are brain involution, is it normal? What are the dementia imaging biomarkers? Now there are several ways that we can look at these imaging biomarkers, PET, CT, MRI, but we're really going to be talking today about MRI, what is easily available in the primary evaluation of a patient, and thus looking at the visual rating assessment systems and also artificial assisted uh, MRI brain volumetry. We will then be looking at the clinical applications, the clinical workflow, example cases, and the take-home message. So brain involution, is it normal? It might come as a surprise to many of you that actually our brain starts to shrink after the age of 30 years old. The rate of shrinkage is anywhere between 0.2 to 0.5% per year. In an abnormal situation, this rate can be up to 10 times more, which is 1 to 2% per year. And it is also abnormal if the rate of shrinkage is asymmetric or regional. Now, it is also useful to know that the hippocampus atrophies at a rate of about 1.5% per year, and in an abnormal situation, it could be up to 4 to 5% per year. So, knowing this, what are the biomarkers of disease that we can see in dementia? Now, this is a very important chart that shows us several markers of disease in dementia, namely Alzheimer's disease. Now, the last green line on your right side is actually the dark green line showing you the point at which there's loss of clinical function. Prior to that, you see the purple line, which is loss of memory. So before these things occur, there are several things going on in the brain. The first is the red line where you see amyloid deposition. Second is the blue line where you see tau protein deposition. And subsequently, when amyloid and tau combine, they form what is called neurofibrillary tangles and cause neuronal damage and subsequently atrophy of the brain. Now, amyloid can be detected either by CSF or PET, which is either invasive or not easily available for us in the primary evaluation of patient. Tau protein evaluation can be again by either imaging or CSF, but as we know, this is still mainly in the research realm. So what is easily available for us in the primary evaluation is really structural imaging. So today, based on this chart, if you see a patient that has clinical symptoms of memory loss or any other symptoms suspicious of dementia, and imaging shows that there are specific areas showing shrinkage in the brain, then the likelihood of this patient having a dementia due to a neurodegenerative process is very high. So these imaging biomarkers were incorporated into the diagnostic guidelines by the National Institute of Aging and the Alzheimer's Association for the diagnosis of dementia in the year 2011. There were several biomarkers that were included, but today we're really going to be talking about two of them, which was hippocampus volume, and the rate of brain atrophy, which we can assess using just regular MRI. Now, how do we assess these abnormalities? Well, there are really two ways. One is that you can take a single time point scan and compare that with a database of healthy individuals to know if the volume of the brain that the patient has is within a normal range. The other way is to take scans at two different time points and calculate the actual rate of atrophy in the brain and then decide whether this is normal or abnormal. So, what are the biomarkers that we can see on MRI? Before we talk about quantitative imaging or artificial intelligence assisted MRI brain volumetry, let's look and see what we can see with our eyes. So, the first system is called the Global Cortical Atrophy Scale. Now, this is a scale graded from 0 to 3 and looks at an overall uh, picture of the brain of how much atrophy has occurred. A score of 2 or more is abnormal because we know that a score of about 1.7 it's the normal for an older adult individual. Now, what is more useful is the medial temporal atrophy scale. It's a scale graded from 0 to 4, and it basically tells us some degree of the involution going on in the hippocampus and the medial aspects of the temporal lobe. Now, we know that a score of 2 or more is abnormal in a person less than 75 years old, and a score of 3 or more is abnormal in a person more than 75 years old. A high MT score has been shown to be sensitive for AD, but not specific. And a high MT score has been shown to correlate with the progression of mild cognitive impairment to dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Now, not all dementias are due to Alzheimer's disease. So sometimes it could be due to things causing parietal atrophy. And this is where the Kadam score comes in. It's a score graded from 0 to 3, and a score of 2 or more is abnormal. Please forward the slide. 
This Kadam score is used in atypical or early onset dementia, usually. Now, the last score that I want to talk about is the Fuzika scale. Now, the Fuzika scale is not really a score looking at atrophic changes, but it's looking at the degree of white matter disease is either due to small vessel disease or some form of vascular etiology. Again, it's graded from 0 to 3, and a score of 2 or more is abnormal. Now, we know that in a normal functioning elderly person with a score of Hasekas 3, a quarter of them will be disabled within a year. We also know that high scores were independently associated with global functional decline. Now, what are the limitations of visual reading? Yeah, we can use it, but unfortunately, there are broad categories. There is inter-observer variability, poor early detection, and we can't really make meaningful comparison with a database of healthy individuals. Also, small temporal changes are difficult to detect. So this is where artificial, in artificial intelligence assisted MRI brain volumetry helps us break free from the limitations of visual reading alone. Now, the, in order to do this, we need to use software to process the MRI brain images to measure the hippocampus, the rate of brain atrophy, and also the detailed cortical volumes. The software that I use is called NeuroQuant, and it is also able to compare the volumes with a database of healthy individuals. This tool is FDA approved, C marked, and HSA certified. Now, this is an example of a report showing you the hippocampus volumes. In essence, as long as the hippocampus volumes are not in the red zone, which is at the 5% statistical significance, it means that they are within the normal range. If it is in the red zone, it means that they are abnormal. Now, the second part of this report is the detailed cortical map. Now, this table may look busy, but really we're looking at patterns. So it gives us a picture of the overall brain volume. It gives us a pattern of lobar volume, whether there's any asymmetry, and to some degree, we can also assess specific cortical patterns as well. So this table, together with information on the hippocampus biomarker, we put that together in order to form what is the likely neurodegenerative process going on in this patient. So of course, forward please. A standard radiology report is included in the brain volumetry report. Volumetric findings are interpreted for you and there is discussion of the findings. Recommendations are suggested if required and there's always ability to consult regarding the findings. So what is the clinical application? Can we use this? So what is the supporting data for it? So in the year 2013, two years after the diagnostic guidelines were updated, this paper was published in Neurology looking at imaging biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. They really looked at PET, tau, I mean, sorry, PET amyloid, PET FDG, and medial temporal atrophy. So what I want to point out here is that you will notice that the specificity to differentiate dementia from healthy controls was equivalent throughout PET amyloid, PET FDG, and even MRI medial temporal atrophy. The only difference is, is the sensitivity where it was lower in atrophic changes. This is expected. And the same is this for mild cognitive impairment where specificity was equivalent, but sensitivity was lower because this is a structural test that will not be able to detect deposition of amyloid and metabolic changes in the brain which occur earlier. So in essence, we have a test that is comparable, but has the standard limitations of a structural test. Now, just recently, in May 2021, a couple of colleagues in Korea did this paper where they were looking at PET tau, which is the upcoming Alzheimer's imaging investigation, and medial temporal atrophy as well. And they found the same thing. Hippocampus volumes or atrophy was as specific as PET tau in differentiating Alzheimer's disease versus healthy controls. The only place where it lacked was in sensitivity, which is expected of a structural test. So, it's a good test, but are people using it? So, in 2019, there was this paper published by the European Society of Neuroradiology that looked at dementia imaging in clinical practice over 193 centers in 28 countries. And they found that 72% of studies were MRI, and more than three quarters of the study were using visual rating, and up to a quarter were using volumetric analysis. And in this volumetric analysis, we will notice that the hippocampus and total brain volumes were the most used because this was part of the imaging guidelines back in 2011. Now what is more interesting is that 
who are referring these cases to us. So the orange part of this pie chart actually shows us that the majority of referrals, more than 50%, were from specialists, which includes neurologists, psychiatrists, and geriatricians. Now, slightly more than a third of referrals also came from primary care physicians, GPs, and family medicine physicians, who were trying to elucidate what was going on in their patient. Now, even more recently was this paper published just last year in 2021, where they compared brain volumetry in, uh, the, in its ability to diagnose Alzheimer's disease in a routine clinical setting. The data used was from the REMEMBER study that was a multi-center retrospective study, and this study included 749 patients. So uh, first I want you to focus on the yellow highlight. Now the ability of volumetry to differentiate Alzheimer's disease to healthy controls was significant because not only was the sensitivity and the specificity high, the UDON index was actually above the threshold, so that was significant. Second, in all other diseases such as subjective cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, there's a common biomarker in all of them, which is the hippocampus volume. So they concluded that, slide forward, okay. They concluded that automatic, no, go back one slide please. They concluded that automatic volumetric tools do improve the diagnostic certainty of Alzheimer's disease in routine clinical practice. And in addition, combining brain structures can improve the diagnostic accuracy when using real-world imaging data from a clinical setting. Slide forward. Okay, so now the question is, some people may say, oh, okay, these studies are done in the West. They don't really reflect Southeast Asia population and definitely not Singapore population. So let's look at this paper that was published in 2011. It was a paper by Duke and US Singapore together with two universities in the US, which were the University of Illinois and the University of Texas. They were looking at the brain structure in young and old East Asian Westerners. So in this study, they looked at Chinese Singaporeans specifically and non-Asian Americans. It was a total of 140 individuals and it was a comparative study of cognitively matched young and old adults. Young were 18 to 30 and old were 60 to 85. They found that there were no group differences in the hippocampus and ventral visual cortex volumes. They also found that the differences in cortical volumes were not significant in the older subjects as a whole. Also, when we're using these tools, we have to know that our degree of abnormality is based on the 5% statistical significance. This means that if anyone has a volume that is below 5% of the normative percentile, it means it would be abnormal. And this would be far below any statistical variations that we may see due to cultural, cognitive, or, um, uh, or rather cultural and ethnic differences. All right? So, it's a good tool. How do we use it in clinical workload? Now, the diagnosis of dementia is really like a jigsaw puzzle. Next slide, please. Now, it involves usually the clinical history and examination, cognitive testing, psychiatric examination, and laboratory testing. Now, we know that all of this really helps us get us closer to the picture of the diagnosis of dementia, but we're not really there because the diagnosis of dementia is a tissue diagnosis. But we will never do tissue diagnosis in a living individual. So the only way that we can get as close as possible to seeing what the brain looks like is by brain imaging. And by far, between PET, CT and MRI, the most easily available tool in, prim in the primary care setting and gives us the most amount of information would be an MRI. And that is usually ordered as an MRI brain or a stroke screen. But unfortunately, these tests are not that good at telling us about the degree of shrinkage in the brain. And this is where artificial intelligence assisted MRI brain volumetry helps to add significant value to our study. So understanding this, the role of imaging in the primary evaluation of dementia has been enhanced. Not only are we looking at ruling out causes such as hemorrhage, brain tumors or strokes, but we are also looking for biomarkers of disease where artificial in intelligence assisted brain volumetry helps. It can show us shrinkage of areas that are specific to particular types of dementia. It enhances the diagnostic certainty of dementia and the type of disease causing dementia. And lastly, gives us a baseline of the extent of degenerative disease in a person.
So, in a patient that is symptomatic, we can look through this table just to understand how we can use this. So, in a patient that has cognitive tests that is normal and imaging biomarker that's negative, the likelihood of dementia due to a neurodegenerative process is low. And it still could be due to subjective cognitive decline or could be due to early onset. But you could hold on to the patient and just do follow-up first. Now, in a person that has a cognitive test that is normal, but the MRI imaging biomarker is positive, then the likelihood of dementia due to a neurodegenerative process becomes intermediate. Now, we still need to exclude whether query subjective cognitive decline is possible or query, uh, query early onset, but then there's a discretionary process that goes on here that may not be just follow-up, but may have to do other tests or subsequent uh, escalation of the patient. Now, if the cognitive test is abnormal and the imaging biomarker is negative, then the likelihood of dementia due to neurogenic process is low to intermediate or it could still be early onset and we definitely have to evaluate for other causes. And finally, of course, if your cognitive test is abnormal and the biomarker is also abnormal, then the likelihood of dementia due to neuro neurodegenerative process is very high. Now, in a patient that has an imaging biomarker that is positive, we can differentiate to some extent by the type of pattern of atrophy that's going on. We know that in Alzheimer's disease, the dominant finding is hippocampus atrophy. We know that in frontal temporal lobe disease, the dominant atrophy is in the frontal lobe. And in a not so common posterior cortical atrophy, the atrophy is more in the parietal and occipital lobes. Now in vascular dementia, atrophy is not so significant, but we would see findings of white matter disease and also strokes and lacunar infarcts. Lewy body dementias usually have a negative MRI. So in order to, to make clear what we're doing, I'm going to share with you several example cases. Now this is a patient that uh, was 81 years old with complaints of memory symptoms and dis disorientations. Now when we did the MRI brain, we found that the Fasica score was at 3 for white matter lesions, but other than that, uh, there was no real lacunar infarcts or tragic infarcts. The global cortical atrophy was about 2, 1, so there was not a lot of atrophy going on as a whole. And this was confirmed on volumetry as well, that the hippocampus didn't show any significant volume loss. And even on the detailed cortical maps, we can see that there was no specific medial temporal related atrophy, though the temporal lobe by itself was a bit lower in volume. So thus, the conclusion here is, is that though there was some degree of atrophy going on, the dominant finding is probably still a vascular etiology. That means probably vascular dementia. Now, this case too is a 74-year-old with suspected dementia. Now, this patient, we did an MRI. The standard MRI was nothing remarkable. There was some mild white matter disease, and the visual rating was between 1 and 2. But when we subjected volumetry to this patient, it showed significant volume loss in the hippocampus. When we did the, the detailed cortical maps, we saw that there were several parahippocampal structures that were also atrophied, and including the entorhinal cortex, which is where usually disease starts in Alzheimer's disease. So, this patient's symptoms were likely due to a neurodegenerative process focused in the medial temporal lobe with a pattern that was suspicious for Alzheimer's disease. And so this information was thus communicated back to the patient, uh, to the physician. So, This last case is a 53-year-old female which was suspected to have young onset dementia and it's one of my favorite cases because this patient actually uh, didn't want to have any radiation or contrast enhanced study and significantly forgetful finding her way to the center and also was forgetting things within the center as well. The MRI brain was generally unremarkable and the MTA score was only one. Now when we did volumetry it showed significant volume loss in the hippocampus and then when we did the detailed cortical volumes, it also showed that she had more areas of cortical volume loss that were significant for someone expected for her age. So what we also found was that when we look at the low bar pattern, that seemed to be an asymmetry of low volumes in the parietal and occipital lobes. Thus, we knew that this patient is likely suffering from a neurodegenerative process um, with a feature pattern that was suspicious for posterior cortical atrophy. This patient was then subsequently started on rivastigmin uh, patches for treatment, and she improved significantly clinically and was able to return back to work. So what's the take-home message? It is this. It's about enhancing the first 
brain scan that the patient has. We know today that imaging biomarkers with brain volumetry is a useful tool to improve the diagnostic certainty of dementia in just routine clinical practice. And this was based on the REMEMBER study in 2021. We also know that this tool can be used by specialists or primary care physicians based on the survey published in 2019 in Europe. And we also know that early detection and appropriate early intervention and care will always have the best outcomes of the patient. And thus, we should not deprive our patients of this when we're especially ordering them an MRI brain or stroke screen because it's the same experience for them. There's no additional scan time and there's no radiation or IV injection involved. So in order to find out more about the scan, please visit Farrah Park's uh, website on dementia services and the specialty centres. And also you could find out more about this tool, reading my article, seeing what we don't see, Dementia AI on Farrah Health. Now, this is just a little snapshot from the New Straits Times that was just published two weeks ago. It is confirmed that the disease burden of dementia is expected to triple by the year 2050 globally. And just within the Southeast Asia alone, more than double. So it is imperative for us to do something about this and get to know the disease better and detect it earlier. Thank you very much.